Welcome to the podcast and video cast from Adventure Explorations. We have quite a show today. We're going to be talking about this incredible experience and journey that Jory Hansen, Boiling Springs, Pennsylvania resident, retired Army Lieutenant Colonel and really quite extraordinary hiker, expert hiker from her time in Colorado and Montana, but all the way through her tours over many years in the Army, from Brussels to Afghanistan to Kosovo. She has a wealth of knowledge and experience that she brought to this climb in Tanzania, all the way up over 19,300 feet to Mount Kilimanjaro. Julie Queen, also an expert hiker, a through hiker, the Appalachian Trail is going to lead the questions today and dive into Jory's story and her friends from her hometown and the journey up and all the struggles and the joys and the beauties along the way. Jory's going to talk about the learnings about the culture, her experience with how fresh the food was and the impact that's made on her. And of course, the struggle, the altitude sickness, the trip to the hospital, and wait for the ending to get Drury's perspective on humanity and the nuanced connections that she made to such a pl- place that she could have only imagined. Joining us now, Julie and Drury. Hi. <laughs> I'm Drury Hansen, and I'm from Boiling Springs, Pennsylvania, and I was very fortunate to be part of a almost three week trip to Tanzania, Africa, where we trekked Kilimanjaro successfully uh, and also went to the Ngorongoro Crater and the Southern Serengeti. Very cool. Anyway, I ate phenomenal food, whether they were cooking it up on the mountain or whether you're staying in these you know, really neat canvas tents on that 11,000 acre, you know, preserve and, you know, they're, uh, they're sustainably farming right. and that's what you're, you know, it's farm to table or the coffee plantation was that way as well. And, uh, and the, the food was absolutely amazing. And I found myself saying like, what the hell do I eat back in the States? I mean, this is so delicious and interesting. Mm-hmm. And I was eating a lot of food and <laughs> drinking a lot of water, and I was like losing weight. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought, like, wow, I'm like, there's, you know, there has to, you know, there has to be something there. I mean, <laughs> really, should I be eating a container of uh, milk chocolate buckeyes from Carnes every week? Maybe that's your takeaway. Maybe, <laughs> you know, like, you know, I, I just, I was surprised though, you know, real, at how interesting things were and getting to tour some of the sustainable farms. Yeah. was really really interesting and seeing what they were doing with squash and watermelon and I, fe- I, I always liked mango and I loved mango flavor but I've never tasted such fresh mango in my life I mean it was just hands down so delicious the bananas are different why are the bananas different <laughs> yeah they're smaller mm-hmm. they taste a little bit different they're not there's not like the you know that uh, like the they can be a little slimy, right? Mm-hmm. Th- they weren't this way. They were a little bit drier. They're kind of I was right. they like plantains, you know, for down south. I found myself just really wondering about the the food and mm-hmm. you know, and yet what we were eating was a hundred percent different from like on the trek. What the uh, what right. the, the the personal uh, what the porters the and staff were eating. Yeah, they ate something called ugali or dale, which is um, you know, but it was interesting. Yeah. yeah. So can you start by telling us a little bit about all your preparation? So travel prep, um, physical prep, anything that you did to get ready for this? The, there was a, an enormous list of, uh, of, you know, administrative stuff, whether it was waivers or just trying to, you know, there was a, a lot of PDFs to sort through. I'm not uh, the biggest fan of everything being digital 
and um, and I thought that was a drawback actually um, you know with this was trying to figure out you know what was there did you miss a PDF and what was important out of a 50 something page document <laughs> but um, uh, but no it was uh, it, the biggest part for me was trying to uh, trying to get over some old injuries and, and trying to, to figure them out so I was coming out of um, my third bout in my lifetime of plantar fasciitis and I would come I was coming out of it then I was having sort of small relapses and I was trying to figure that out I finally went into physical therapy or to a uh, podiatrist and then into physical therapy and we figured out a bunch of things and and it was painful and very tedious but in the end it really really worked and I can say that um, you know I was able to to sort of rise to the occasion just in time in terms yeah. of hiking, you know, being and then actually being able to put some weight on my back and hike as well was, you know, because you could hire a personal part, a personal porter from the beginning and you, uh, all it was was just you and your hiking poles and you had a personal porter who would carry all your day, daytime stuff that you would need, all the different layers and all your water and some snacks. and um, But, you know, I was actually able to do like I did the first five days, which are the, you know, arguably like the easier days because mm -hmm. you're at lower elevation, and um, uh, and do it successfully. So, you know, really, I I just every week I was trying to get um, six mile hikes. I knew they weren't going to be long daily hikes, but I knew they would be at altitude, and I also knew that I shouldn't be beating up my feet. Right. It's a strange thing when you get out there, they're going slow, right? So the, um, you know, the adage is pole pole, which is Swahili, means slow. Mm -hmm. uh, if you say pole once, it means I'm sorry. Pole pole means slower, slow slower. Yes. And so that's their, you know, the big mantra, because once you're at altitude, you have to flip to a different mindset of you're just trying to, uh, you're trying to coax your body into not reacting right. to altitude and to adjust appropriately. So they were doing daily um, uh, pulse oximeter mm -hmm. checks, and you could and they're recording the results. And you could just see we started at ten thousand on uh, the first day, okay. and we started ten thousand feet. The summit is nineteen three, and so we were mm -hmm. uh, we took the ten day, which has a much higher percentage of success. And five out of the five made it, and in some ways it was a miracle. But I can see how that poly poly adage. Mm -hmm. I can see how that works. But right. for me in training, I'm used to just go out and do it fast, knock it out, and then be done. Right. And like so that five days I was carrying my pack. I was carrying my pack for like eight hours. Right. Yeah. And and I was kind of. You know, I mean, I'm getting, yeah, I'm getting adjusted to things as well. But it's not about going fast. It's mm -hmm. about going slowly and not, uh, you know, coaxing your body into keeping a nice, uh, a nice percentage of oxygen mm -hmm. in your bloodstream. And you know, your but my, my pulse rate, which is normally 65, mm -hmm. on average, the entire 10 days, it was 99 and 100 yeah. and something. Uh, that wow. was that was my regular. <laughs> Very different. Yeah, that was my my pulse rate. But after I dumped that pack, at, you know, like mm -hmm. day six, my, uh, you know, it was uh, on the average set just seventeen pounds. But it's also seventeen pounds at altitude. Right. And like and for eight hours a day, right? Yeah. Was, yeah. Yeah. On average, eight hours a day. And so even though it wasn't, you know, particularly heavy, it was for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. And. And I was amazed to find how my uh, my oxygen percentages were changing. But one of their techniques is, uh, and the reason that it's 10 days, you go around the backside of the mountain and then come up. And part of that is because it allows you to uh, go from 10,000 feet, camp at 10,000 feet, and then camp at, I think, like 13.5, mm -hmm. right? And then at 13.5, I started to experience my first altitude sickness. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing that I had in my kit bag was that I had done 14ers out in Colorado years ago. And so I knew a little bit about living at altitude when I lived out there and then also about doing 14ers and that they're sort of a point, right. you know, for me and that I don't, I, I do feel the altitude. So I knew it was a something that was out there. And um, so I started to feel it. And then the next day we came down 
no, we want more, like one more day hiking over hill over dale and through these like ravines and stuff. And then we came down to two camps two nights in a row mm-hmm. that were a little bit lower than that 13.5. Mm-hmm. And then you felt like you were, like it was like 12.5. Right. And you felt like you were, you know, strong. You, you Like your body just rebounded. Then you go back up, you know, and you were at 14, you know, and it was amazing how it worked. There. Mm-hmm. But at 14,000 feet, this is crazy. So we were on the back side um, where Amboseli National Park is in Kenya. Mm-hmm. And so, but what it looked like at night, the Milky Way, the stars. I mean, if there was a, a spiritual, yeah, yeah. if there was a spiritual aspect to it, it was it was that. Yeah. I mean, it was, um, unfortunately, with taking Dimox, you were not going to get away with not having to get up and go pee in the middle of the night. At least once or twice. Mm-hmm. <laughs> twice would just about, you know, you were just... But almost ready to be mad, and then you would be like, you know, zzz, zzz, right? Out of the two, they had big. Ag- they had the big Agnes tents, which for my height was perfect because mm-hmm. there was a spot I could actually stand up, right? <laughs> yeah, in there, um, and that helps a lot with your back. But we were on cots with like a, there was like a foam, a foam mattress like covered in fabric, right? Right, it was just a foam piece, um, you know, that you would use to upholster. Yeah, <laughs> and so, uh, but it was. It was incredibly comfortable mm-hmm. um, and you know rarely did you have like a flat spot so you know you had you know the funny antics of you know the water the hot water bottle yeah. the warm water bottle that's in your sleeping bag eventually it goes all the way down to the bottom it falls off the end mm-hmm. everything's sliding a little bit right. you know and you get to do like the you know, like pull everything <laughs> back up and like try to do this like inchworm right. you know, thing in a research way. But, uh, but no, I think the spiritual aspect for me, the, the biggest one that would hit me, I mean, sometimes when I was out hiking ahead a little bit, I was just finding my peace. Right. It was so beautiful, the landscape, whether it was the barren landscape above, you know, the alpine. Right. Or, it, it, you know, there was just so much. But at 14,000 feet, we saw a Cape Buffalo um, and Seven Eland. They were heading to these mineral salt caves. Oh, that are up there at high altitude, mm-hmm. and uh, and that was just uh, an yeah. unbelievable experience. And then they had these ravens; they're like the the they're like the uh, the picnic birds, mm-hmm. you know. They had these just huge ravens, and then they had white on the the nape of their neck and a little bit on their mm-hmm. back, just different from ours. And they would come in no matter how barren and horrible the weather was. These yeah. ravens would follow, would come to your camp, and yeah. you know, be hopping around, and they were, they really, uh, you know, it's just funny. I mean, like, it didn't matter how how terrible it yeah. was. So, so would you say that connection was more with like the landscape and the animals that you sort of felt with yeah. the people, a little bit of everything? Oh my gosh, so much of that trip is I associate with. The people that I got to meet, the people mm-hmm. that were on, on the trek, and then even on the other, uh, on the other, the other aspects of it, the people that were our guides, right? Um, you know, for the Serengeti. But um, you know, we spent the most time was spent with the uh, with the trek, and it was uh, ten days hiking, eleven mm-hmm. days total, I think. Right. And um, and they were, you know, so much of it was uh, sharing culture and. Um, you know, they were got around actually that I was a soldier, mm-hmm. and uh, mm-hmm. and then being a woman, yeah, you know that it, it sort of okay. So I figured out that um, you know, so some of the uh, some of the the guides and the porters got to see a little bit of your bio, okay, you know, mm-hmm. and I don't think I really put anything online because it, it was a funny question that, you know, made it sound like there were limitations, like what limitations do you have that we should know mm-hmm. about or something? And so I, I it was, it, it didn't, it wasn't just about the track. It was about right. like everything. I, so I don't think I put 
I, I don't think I really put anything. Right. <laughs> but I figured there were three women, and we're all about the same size, mm-hmm. and <laughs> like about the same height and about the same size, and we're white. <laughs> and I figured out <laughs> that the personal porters and the assistant guides would ask would ask me questions, and I figured out they were trying to figure out who was who out of the white girls. <laughs> And it was just so funny because we're all so different from from Mm -hmm. one another, you know. But there was this, like, everybody's just kind of jumping in, and they're trying to remember what they read. Right. And then, like, one day I had this, like, really, really funny conversation that just seemed like it was completely out of the blue, and it, it had to do with perfume. And I'm like, we're like, we're out here trekking. We all stink. (laughs) And why is this... This personal porter, he just says like, he's like, hey, see, he's like, what do you think of perfume? And I thought, well, this is really. And yeah. I said, oh, is that an indication that you smell pretty bad? And I was, I said, I said, no. Uh, I said, I don't really, I don't really think anything about. For, I don't really, I don't. It's not for me. I didn't want to mm-hmm. say, you know. Yeah. And and I thought like, am I going to even be able to explain essential oils to the like if, if there's anything that gets me to like mm-hmm. smells that I enjoy, it's essential mm-hmm. oils. And I just thought, I don't even know if I can translate this. Why? Mm-hmm. It turns out that that someone else had filled out about extreme sensitivity, olfactory sensitivity oh, to perfumes. To perfumes and yeah. extreme smells like body odor. Yeah. But no, getting to meet them and find it, you know, finding out uh, you know, about their family and and even how, you know, in Tanzania the, the president died mm-hmm. uh, of COVID. The president died and the majority of the cabinet, his cabinet, mm-hmm. died of COVID. But yet they're also a really young country. So right. we got to talking about uh, Zanzibar and Tanganyika and, mm-hmm. you know, uh, and how Tanganyika gained its independence in 61. And then in 64, they created Tanzania. Well, if you think about it, they're a 60-year-old country. Mm-hmm. And so they're struggling, uh, it, you know. Um, I think that mountain's not nearly as busy as it typically is, but the busier mm-hmm. camps were when we were descending, mm-hmm. and I, you know, and it was some of it was just gross. I mean, the facilities yeah. and you know, so right. but so the toilet, the toilet tent <laughs> is a cartridge toilet. It reminds me of an RV. Okay, and, and so they would set up this little tent, and it was just for like the patrons, right? Or, you know, just like, like for, yeah, us. It was a privacy, privacy tent. It was a privacy over tent like, over this cartridge toilet. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> it sounds, uh, you know, it's, it, it sounds, I don't know, like uh, ridiculous. But it, one, there were, uh, there's rules of, about the mountain mm-hmm. and like where you can go and where you can't or whatever. But it just sort of, it sort of kept everything. Thing from uh, it kept you like in your like closer to your tent, but because you were drinking and eating so much, mm-hmm. like you had to use the bathroom maybe th- three at least three times, mm-hmm. you know, as much as you normally. Right. You, <laughs> and the whole place is volcanic rock, mm-hmm. so you know, so being, you know, trying to be one with nature mm-hmm. or be friendly with nature. You know, was a another. You know, it was just. An, it's an odd thing we all had to deal with, <laughs> right? So, yes, interesting. Can you tell us a little bit about why is Kilimanjaro always something you've wanted to do? Are are the seven summits on your list? <laughs> <laughs> what what made you want to do it? Uh, I never thought I would get to Africa. Okay, I wasn't opposed to Africa. I just thought this is something that might not happen in my lifetime. Just some of it just cost, um, right. you know, but you look at your personal situation and you say, I don't really see people around me that are, mm-hmm. you know, gunning to go to Africa. And so all of a sudden this came up as a possibility. It was almost exactly a year ago and it was, wow, that came together pretty quick. Yes. Um, for Shelly, it didn't. Shelly had been planning it for a year and a half. I okay. think by the time, you know, that it all came through and we were going to go this summer Mm -hmm. and then her Shelly's husband Lou uh, 
was having trouble with his hip and actually got a hip replacement. Unbelievable to me. And he actually made it. Like, so this summer he had a hip replacement. Wow. And he's a big guy. He's like 250 pounds. And and summited. He summited. Yeah. These were folks that you met on the trek or you knew beforehand? No, yeah, I knew them beforehand. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, but not necessarily well. Right. And so Shelly mentioned something to me about the trip 11 months ago, but not necessarily like you should do it. Right. You know, I just was excited for her mm-hmm. and I just said, wow, I always, I always said if I went to Africa that I would, uh, I'd have to see the Serengeti. And she's like, I, I got that. <laughs> I got that. You know, we're, we're going to yeah. do the Serengeti. We're going to do safari. I said, wow, that's awesome. But uh, Kilimanjaro, I, I, you know, I'd heard about it through the years. I knew it was one of the easier summits, mm-hmm. even though even though it's 19,300. Right. So I always say, you know, the, the things you can't control, you know, on something like, even if it's easy, is it's weather and how your body's gonna mm-hmm. react to, uh, to elevation. And um, yeah, so I, I, I think that it was something that, uh, as soon as I heard that Shelly was doing this trip, I, I, you know, it resonated with me uh, and I thought that's, you know, really cool. But at, at this point in my life, I'm just trying to find things that I can, you know, things that are a challenge that I can, with reasonable, you know, percentage of success, I can, I can right. do. I'm not trying to, to, to bite off more than I can. And, you know, this just seemed like, uh, you know, such an incredible thing. I knew that, I knew Rob wasn't interested, in, you know, in somebody, mm-hmm. <laughs> in somebody Kilimanjaro, mm-hmm. but you know, the rooftop of Africa, right? Like, how can you beat that? And it was that spectacular. Like on day seven, so it's eight days up, two days down. Mm-hmm. Day seven, you're rolling into, you know, the high. You're staying at the highest camp you've stayed. It's at fifteen five, and the track. Kilimanjaro has three main peaks. So you have Mwenzi uh, on one end, you have uh, Kibo in the middle, and on top of Kibo is Uhuru Peak, the very highest one. That's the 19.3. And then okay. you have another one called Shira. Shira is the side we started on. Shira exploded in a volcanic eruption and is a lot lower than the other one. So we started over on that end and then came completely around and uh, at 15.5 going into Kibo mm-hmm. hut, um, you know, that I like I felt absolutely fantastic. And now, but that hike in, you go up into what they call the saddle mm-hmm. between Moenzi and Kibo. And on both sides of you, you can't see a single ounce of terrain that you had hiked the last seven days. Wow. <laughs> like the last six, I guess, because yeah. you're on day seven. You don't, you can't, because you come up over this and then you're on this and you drop down. It's the saddle. Mm-hmm. You're on this saddle, like between, and it, like, and there's nothing alive. It's just barren moon landscape, and Mwenzi is gorgeous, and you're hiking towards, you can see like some little outbuildings. They look like little outbuildings, mm-hmm. and it takes you seven hours to get there. <laughs> Like yeah. all day, you're just watching them just get a little bit bigger mm-hmm. and a little bit bigger, and you're just steadily walking, and it's beautiful but barren. And on both sides of the saddle are your the as the as it's warming up down below the um, the cumulus clouds are building, mm-hmm. and that like and that's all you're seeing. It looks like you're on the edge of the earth right. on the right and on the left. And you're watching clouds just coming up a little bit higher, a little bit higher. You can't see one single piece of terrain that you had hiked the last six days. Wow. And that was just this incredible, surreal mm-hmm. kind of feeling. It was a great day. I'd never been at 15.5, like, you know, in my life, because right. I had done 14ers. And so then we stayed at 15.5. Summit day mm-hmm. was. Um, uh, you wake up at three, wake up at three, you're hiking by four. Mm-hmm. And so, and then that was a 14 hour uh, push to. Summit push? Yes. Up and back to. 
up and then we stayed at Crater Camp, which was the most miserable experience of my life because that's where, and when I got, I felt fine, but I took my Diamox meds at 3.30 mm-hmm. and it's at every 12 hour and I didn't realize here I was at the highest peak and they were running out. Oh. And so I got altitude sickness and I, I did on your way back down. Yes. Um, like at the peak, I felt weird. And then we went and we camped at 18, 18, five. Mm-hmm. And so everybody was going to experience it at some level. Right. But my meds had worn off, had worn off. And you didn't have more with you. I did. I just didn't put two and two together. Oh, because normally what would happen is you're, I was taking them at breakfast at six, mm-hmm. six thirty and then right dinner and so i just didn't put it together and then i just felt awful so going into crater camp which is this big crater from a, another volcanic eruption on kibo mm-hmm. and it was just so surreal yeah. and you know uh and it was a limited camp as well meaning that the majority of the camp importers were, had gone had well, actually, they don't summit, and they, right, so they okay. just move the camp like down to this other location mm-hmm. that you'll be at the next day. So yeah. we split the camp that day, and um, you know, so it was incredible. And then, honestly, it, <coughs> all the rest for me is a blur because I was mm-hmm. vomiting mm-hmm. and uh, and just struggling to keep right liquids down, and then just trying to get down out of altitude. Right. And then uh, I gutted out really the next three days Mm -hmm. on like next to no food yeah and um and then I ended up eventually going to the hospital oh really yeah I couldn't I was just so sick so Mm -hmm. nauseous and uh you know even after descending all the way yes okay yeah I just still I think I I think I just didn't have anything left but yeah I I literally I gutted it out yeah (laughs) no pun intended (laughs) I gutted it out the last couple of days and um and I was I didn't have the headache, the screaming mm-hmm. headache that you have up on Crater Camp, right. but, um, but the, I just couldn't kick the, the nausea. That um, you mentioned, you know, waking up in the morning waiting for people, did that build like a sense of camaraderie or was there ever a sense of like annoyance, like, oh, I wish that person would get ready faster? Or was it really just a team, like you were either all going to summit together or you weren't? Um. I, we, we had some discussions mm-hmm. uh, about um, would we all, I and mean, we all knew we wanted to summit together, right. and we didn't want to break apart the, the team, mm-hmm. but we also had some intelligent discussions with the head guide and mm-hmm. assistant guides about there might be a point on right. summit day where we have to make a decision, mm-hmm. and you know they had the ability to split mm-hmm. the emergency gear okay. as well as um, you know, the number of like guides and, you know, so we ended up all summoning together, mm-hmm. which was great. Um, you know, but Lou, he, uh, he ended up, uh, they ended up stretching him for a day and a half to get down. Like he was, he was done. Like, I mean, that was, you know, like he gave it his all yeah. to get to that summit. And, uh, you know, that was, uh, uh, pretty, I, I don't know how he did it. I mean, I would just say, like, I, like that guy's got my respect. I mean, mm-hmm. I, you know, how it, to, to, the terrain that we were going through mm-hmm. and doing, none of it was, like, technical in terms of ropes and stuff. But right. for somebody who's never a hiker, didn't know how to use trekking poles, right. you know, to, to stabilize, and, you know, and he, he cut it out. You know, God, right? <laughs> like made it. I couldn't believe he made it. Wow, that's it was great. And I do like we tell him, and he, oh, he he's hilarious. I think we had a great crew. We could laugh about some things. Um, you know, I mean, we really were laughing about you know some things. But yeah, when you're waiting around, you know, that's the the takeoff time is this, mm-hmm. and you're waiting around, and your feet are going numb because you're waiting on somebody, and it's past time to leave. Right. You know, there's. There's an amount of, you, you try to exact maybe a little tiny bit of peer pressure, right? you know, like later on with a, a joke or, right. you know, I mean, you just try to find some levity, mm-hmm. you know, in there. But we never, I don't think we ever had the, because uh, uh, Sam would, Sam would actually tell us. Like Sam was your lead guide? Yeah, Sam was the, the head guide and Sam would say, yeah, this, this group really gets along well. 
That's and great. I didn't really know Donna and David. They're friends of the Capozzi's. Um, and so Shelly and Lou. And so in some ways, I think mm-hmm. that was nice because, right. uh, you know, you had the ability while mm-hmm. you're hiking to just have nice, small, c- casual conversations. Right. And, and getting to know people. Yeah. And then, you know, so we were, you know, we were doing, you know, doing that. And, um, <clears throat> You know, everybody had their strengths mm-hmm. and you know weaknesses, and I I, I I can't imagine how miserable Lou was the entire <laughs> trip, and he made it. I can't, I, I could not believe it. And uh, you know, Thompson Safaris, their uh, their success rate is uh, over ninety percent on the Grand Traverse, and I can mm-hmm. see why. But that technique of going very very slow, very mm-hmm. deliberately, um, and then also the staying at a higher elevation and then doing that i think we did that for two nights we stayed at like 13 something and two right. then we dropped down for two days to a thousand you know a yep. thousand or two thousand people low mm-hmm. and, and went back up. yeah and it allowed our bodies to adjust but to go from this elevation right to, to that is yeah yeah it's, <laughs> you know i just felt so lucky to be you know, a part of it. Oh, I, you know, some of the cool things. You don't even have to know Swahili to see, um, you know, good leadership skills. Mm. To see, uh, not just leadership skills, but also good mentoring skills. Mm-hmm. So this is where I was. So I kind of got interested in, um, you know, watching the personal porters um, and the assistant guides and the head guide. And they would pull them back, and they would actually be given classes. Oh, interesting. So they were, you know, and it just reminded me so much of the military mm-hmm. and a lot of that, what we would call hip pocket training. Like mm-hmm. you're out here, you have this, you know, you have this sure. chance to take advantage of it. And so, you know, that was just another really interesting thing. And then talking later on, I, I was talking to uh, to the head guide about it, and I said, yeah, I said you, I said yeah, I said, and he said, and he looked at me, he was so surprised. He said, you're exactly right. I was <laughs> teaching them about um, about plants. Oh. Like in that discussion, we were yeah. talking about the plants and you know pulling things together. But yeah, it was um, you know everything. Oh, so I really expected the whole time around the mountain to be like without communications, mm. and I think you actually got something from me. Yeah, I did on the mountain. <laughs> yeah, that was I was surprised. Like they like day something. Yeah, you know. Day four, and it was the guys kind of knew when they would have um, like Service. a couple spots where there was sur- <laughs> like where there, where there was a satellite <laughs> blip, you know, passing through, and that was fun uh, to to connect. But then I was ready to disconnect. disconnect. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I didn't want to. I didn't want to play with it anymore. Mm-hmm. I did take some videos, um, and I think I can. Looking back at them, I can tell that alti- that I really felt altitude <laughs> because. They ramble. They're like a good eight minutes. Yeah. You know, eight <laughs> minutes for what was supposed to be like yeah. a little minute and a half video clip. What were your um, travel, what was your travel like? And we conveniently have a map back here. And we actually have a little mountain there. Oh, look. For Kilimanjaro. So what, um, where did you fly out of? Where did you fly into? We flew out of JFK. Okay. Yeah, so we flew out of JFK, and then we flew over to Amsterdam, right over here, there, Yep. Netherlands, Amsterdam, from Amsterdam, it was straight in to, um, and straight into Kilimanjaro uh, Airport, actually, oh, wow. so it wasn't too far, but then, uh, so it's not too far from like Serengeti Plains, mm-hmm. but then uh, we ended up going to this ranch, this that eleven thousand acre preserve, mm-hmm. um, and um, we stayed there for two days. We got there fifteen minutes before midnight. Wow! On New Year's <laughs> Eve. Oh, that's fine. We got a day early, and then we ended up getting a chance to roam around um, with a safari vehicle, mm-hmm. uh, but there were like baboons that came through the camp and bush wow. buck in the morning. <laughs> I actually did some, I did, I watched a YouTube video. Um, there was a, a like a, a big like double thatch hut, uh, like two main areas and that was 
but I have this neat like reflection of the um, uh, the uh, acacia trees yeah. are really prominent in uh, in that part of the I think in that part of the world. But um, they play a really important role with you know elephants right. and, and giraffes mm -hmm. and, and you know, I don't know how they manage to how anything can manage to eat the thorns um, <laughs> and stuff off them, but they right. do. Um, and um, so I have actually some. I did a little bit of an astral photography experiment when I was cool. there. You got had a chance to go through all the photos you've taken. I just started on Friday. Did you? They're, We're excited to see them. Yeah, yeah they're neat. They are. Uh, I just was playing around um, on that astral photography, and um, there's a glow on the acacia trees, mm -hmm. and then you know a million yeah. stars. Wow. But um, you know, so it was it was fun uh, for sure. And then uh, I used the good camera. I didn't take the good camera on the track. I felt like, uh, well, they advised against it. Um, but then I just also felt guilty about the amount of weight. Like mm -hmm. I would be adding, you know, to the, you right. know. And then the other part was batteries, mm -hmm. you know, and being able to try to keep things charged. Right. And so I, I didn't do it. But uh, the ones from the Safari and the Serengeti uh, are, they're phenomenal mm. so yeah I felt like that was a um, that was worthwhile right yeah, yeah. and uh, but the Serengeti portion uh, I never never in a million years would have thought that I could spend two nights in Serengeti National Park in the bush in mm -hmm. these like like 1950s Ernest Hemingway canvas tents oh cool and like this, the Scout style. It tents. was old the, school. Yeah. <laughs> it was, and there was a, there were um, armed guards, like mm -hmm. for because of the, you know, you could hear the hyenas, mm -hmm. uh, you know, both nights you could hear them calling to each other, you know, whip, whip, and it, you know, it was just a really cool uh, sound. You could hear lions calling that, woof. Mm -hmm. You know, sort of trying to connect with each other. That was farther, further away. Um, but it was super, super dry. We came through the Great Rift Valley. Mm -hmm. So if you know anything about the plate tectonics and yeah. what creates modern day Africa, um, between the Ngorongoro Crater, mm -hmm. um, there's this whole ecosystem that then connects to the Serengeti. And the Great Rift Valley lies in between. Mm -hmm. And it was like a desert I mean it was bad and I just thought oh my gosh these people are going to starve to death mm -hmm. you know that are here and it's um you know I, I mean when they say like it's a dirt poor country it's a dirt poor mm -hmm. country it really really is and yet you saw these incredibly capable people that you know are they seem to have really really good family life mm -hmm. and uh and then you just saw the uh the ambition mm -hmm. and uh, you know And so there was, uh, there were these just neat aspects to it too, which made it very, a very rich right. environment in in different ways. But, um, but going through the Great Rift Valley, it was just it was so so dry. And of all things, uh, when we got up to the Serengeti, so in November they're do they usually get light a uh, light rains, like not a monsoon mm -hmm. season, but and they didn't really happen. No. And so here we were, it's January and everything's just dry, 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 dry. And while we were there, we got rains mm. two nights in a row. And you could just see everything changing. And the yeah. wildebeest were actually, like they can oh, wow. smell, like almost like they can mm -hmm. smell yeah. that in the air. And they started, their, their wildebeest, were, we actually got to see them coming and crossing the road in their migration. Wow. And so they were coming to what, uh, for most of them, is their calving grounds. Mm. And it was just really, really interesting. And yeah, you got to see a landscape change, like dry. Yeah, yeah. And, then we, and then we flew out of there and over mm -hmm. the Great Rift Valley, you know, portion. It was way right. better to fly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it was it was amazing to go to another country, mm -hmm. and you know, some things were shocking. It was just shocking how poor. I mean, there's mm -hmm. basically, it felt like there's one paved road, right, to anything major. Everything else is dirt, and then, but then the people, I found to be. 
phenomenal. Mm -hmm. I mean, in their, you know, even some of their culture, sometimes you couldn't uh, communicate much with them, but you could still communicate in different ways. Right. Maybe you couldn't communicate directly with language or using language, but, um, you know, the things that you got a sense of. And, you right. know, I think we're, I think picking Thompson was, was the right move, mm -hmm. especially when I had to go to the hospital. Right. I felt like this is part of what you, you know, probably pay that extra money for is that the fact that they've got, you know, they've got the resources lined mm -hmm. up to make sure that you're going to a place that's safe. I ended up actually going to a hospital that's owned by an American, mm -hmm. uh, an American doctor, I guess. I didn't see an American doctor, right. but, you know, um, you know, there's a little bit of a, a peace of mind that's, mm -hmm. you know, there. Like, okay, I don't have to worry about getting hepatitis. Yeah. <laughs> so... Yeah. <laughs> Um, but no, yeah. it was Again, just going back to what you said about communication, like it can be so humbling when you can't communicate communicate well with people. I find to having to pick up on those facial cues and just like body language. Yeah, like we can't really communicate well verbally. Yeah, you, you figure it out, right? Yeah. yeah, some of the guys on the uh, some of the guys on the trek, mm -hmm. some of the um, general porters. So the the guys that you interacted with the most had the best English. Mm -hmm. It was pretty much. You know, and it, you could just see where English was such an yeah. advantage, you know, for them. And then when, so the guy that I hired as a personal porter was already there on uh, on staff doing like some general porter. And his English wasn't, wasn't perfect, but he was really good friends with a lot of the other guys that knew me from the previous five days. And so he'd sleep with the tent. He mm -hmm. would like so he would sleep in the tent with those guys and he would talk to them. And then I could tell there was a different mm -hmm. level of understanding like the next day, you know, like about right. things and you know and so I finally I, I said to him, you know, just simple things. I said like, Hey, I said, I heard those guys call you Bob uh Baba Jimmy <laughs> you know. And he and he got he was looking down and he got the biggest smile on his face. <laughs> and I said I said, They called you Baba Jimmy, right? And he says, Mm hmm and I said What's Baba mean? I said, I'm going to guess it means father. He said, mm. <laughs> And then I was like, how many kids do you have? Mm. And he was stumbling, but he so wanted to communicate mm -hmm. to tell me about his kids. Yeah. You know, and it was just a really, really cool, nice, slowly unfolding conversation. Yeah. You know, with him where, you know, I knew like, okay, because by the time I hit crater camp I was really ill yeah and he completely got me moving that day mm -hmm. I mean I was so out of it I'm mean, where you just it feels like tunnel vision yeah. you're you're nauseous you're vomiting you're trying to figure out you're trying to fight the that and then you're you know and the last thing you're trying to it's zero degrees yeah. <laughs> and you're like what do you, what do I have to put on right you know what do I have to do to get out of here because I know like I know I can't stay, yeah. <laughs> and nobody's gonna rescue me. Right? You know, like I gotta get out of it. Yeah, out of this place. You know, it was. Uh, we were all successful, and uh, you know, the last thing in the world I would have wanted was to be like, you know, saying goodbye to Kilimanjaro without having been on the top. Yeah. yeah. Did you hear a quote, or have you read a quote, or has something come to mind? You're like, this would this would summarize my trip. Or not really. Some, <laughs> something you heard one of them say, or something you read, um, something in your mind. You're like, I should put this on a T-shirt. <laughs> you know, it's probably Swahili. Yeah, it probably is a little, you know, jumbo mumbo bo. Right. You know, po is good. Okay. Right. So, uh, um, but there was something about that that just felt like everybody was cheering for one another. Mm -hmm. You know, you're acknowledging. You know, people running, you know, yeah. people are, uh, you know, coming by you on the trail or, you know, or people are passing, you know, and they're not even on your crew. Right. And, you know, there was something there that felt, mm -hmm. you know, just felt like everybody was rooting for everyone else. Yeah. I talked about this a little bit, but um, I like in America. There's just is, you know, there's there's such a like a racial awareness 
that's going on. But that entire trip, I, I never felt they looked at us like anything mm -hmm. different. They, it was just, I felt like we were all on one team, like mm -hmm. together doing this. Yeah. Um, I didn't, I never felt us them and they're Tanzanian. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, <laughs> I wish this is how it felt in our country. How you don't have to be like on edge or, you know, I'm like, it was just, it was just very, very normal. Mm -hmm.